If you're from around here, these landmarks will conjure up memories of good times. Fishing in the sun, swimming with friends, and just chilling on the banks of the Delaware River. Milford Montague Bridge, Minisink Island, River Beach Campground, Stokes and High Point State Forest, Milford Beach. Lazy days in the sun, floating on inner tubes, laughing with friends. Those days of summer that seem endless when you're young. Here in Milford and Montague, those landmarks, or at least some of them, embody our good times as youngsters, and the memories will hold dear all through life. At the heart of all those landmarks is the Delaware River. You hear the gentle rush of the water. Can you feel the warmth of the sun on your shoulders? Then, as the sun sets, hear the lonesome call of the owls, the churring of the crickets and cicadas. If you lie on the river bank with your eyes closed, the soft murmuring of the water and the song of the insects will transport you far away to a place where all is peaceful. Personally, I have a heap of memories all centered around time spent on the banks of the Delaware. That river was a big part of my life, still is. A long time ago, when I had just gotten my driver's license, me and some of the guys started a little tradition during July. We loved the river and loved fishing and swimming there every chance we got. Every year, starting around the third week of July, we packed light gear, lots of beer, and we headed down to Quicks Island. There, we set up a tent where the river and the island kind of met. If you've been there, you know the exact spot where I'm talking about. There's enough room for the tent, a nice fire pit, and fishing. Back in the day, it was rare to be disturbed even by anyone in that spot. And we spent our first three nights there, reconnecting and relaxing, just having a good time. Do you ever think about how nothing bothered you when you were younger? I mean, like sleeping on the ground by the river, barely eating anything that didn't come from the snack section of the store. Shitting in the woods. Nothing. Nothing bothered us back then. And then we grew up, but we still took the trip every year. Now, a few years ago, it was no different. Except that by the time we reached Quicks Island, we were tired and achy. We traded swimming for beers on the bank and chatted by the fire as the sun set. There was nothing remarkable about that evening. Everything was normal. You know... It was the usual idle chatter about days gone by, and interjections about how much our lives have changed or stayed the same since graduating high school. The four of us had never been skittish about staying out all night in the woods. Hell, we'd been doing it our whole lives and we loved it. And I'll stop here and say that none of us were drunk. We were all still on our first beers of the night, when all four of us just stop talking. The rush of water, the wind through the leaves. Everything seemed normal, but something was very wrong, too. And we all must have felt it simultaneously, because all chatter stopped at the same time. We exchanged looks with each other. Bobby pointed across the river and said something was over there. He was sure of it. The rest of us moved so the fire was at our backs and squinted through the settling darkness, trying to see what was there. It felt as if something was there, looking back at us in the dark. But it didn't feel natural. Not like wildlife, not like a person, not even a person with bad intentions. It was different, and a chill ran down my arms as I stared into the blackness of the trees. I never saw anything definitive move over there in the woods, but I certainly felt its presence. Scary and intimidating in a way I'd never felt before. None of the others said a word, only stood looking like Johnny Bench, watching for movement just like me. Then it hit me, what was wrong? There were no crickets, cicadas, owls, bats, or any other critter making noises. Just as I opened my mouth to mention this to the others, 
an unearthly, blood-curdling scream tore through the night. Birds took flight, small nocturnal critters scurried in the underbrush, and everything seemed to move away from that god-awful sound. Bobby dropped his beer and stumbled backward, nearly going into the fire on his ass. Startled and more than a little scared, the rest of us retreated to the opposite side of the fire before we stopped to make sure Bobby was okay. The scream lasted only a few seconds, but I'm telling you, I probably aged ten years in that short span of time. Whatever had screamed had set my heart racing, my legs trembling, and my mind whirling. Now, I'm sure you know how a group of guys recover from something that scared the hell out of them. Well, they laugh it off and then they have a couple more beers. That's exactly what we did. We weren't going to tuck our tails and run. Not without risk losing face, anyway. I mean, that thing, whatever it was, had screamed from the other side of the river. It hadn't charged through the water and attacked us. It had just screamed and moved off noisily through the forest. We were safe, right? So we drank a couple of beers, and then we had a couple more, still laughing too loudly and telling stories of our super bravado. Just to be honest, we were being so loud and boisterous in hopes of keeping the thing away. It works with most animals. You make as much noise as possible and make yourself seem bigger than you really are, and most critters give you wide berth. There's easier prey in the wild than four big, beer-swigging, noisy men after all. The sun set behind the mountain, leaving us at the mercy of the nearly full moon and our low-burning fire. The conversation waned a bit, the laughter lagged and finally died completely. The small logs and branches on the fire popped and snapped as loud as gunshots. I wasn't the only one who jumped almost every time it happened. We were all still on edge, 45 minutes after the incident. And then it happened again. That godless, wailing scream. It was almost at the exact same spot as before. I saw three sets of eyes that were stretched too wide when I looked to my friends. The scream was shorter, but it didn't make my heart beat any slower than it had before. Bobby scrambled to his pack and snatched out a flashlight. It was an 800 lumen LED. He ran to the shoreline and pierced the dark with that light, swinging it back and forth against the line of trees on the other side. The rest of us were slower in getting our lights and joining him. Even with our weaker lights, the other side of the river was flooded with light bright enough to see if there had been anything moving there. There wasn't. Bobby suggested that we go across the river and hunt down whatever was over there. Brad and Jamie were all over that suggestion like flies on roadkill. I, however, was not so keen on hunting anything that could make such a horrendous sound. Especially not in the dark and in the woods. I made my argument and they branded me a wimp, telling me to stay and babysit the fire and beer, that the real men would be back soon. Well, huh, that didn't fly. I flipped them off and joined their little suicidal search and destroy party. We had to walk downstream a couple hundred feet to the shallow crossing spot. And, well... I'd be lying if I said I wasn't terrified. We were halfway across the shallow when that scream tore loose from the tree line again. I nearly bolted in the opposite direction. If Brad hadn't been there in my way, I might have. The thing had tracked us downstream. Bobby's light was on the spot before the sound stopped. There was still nothing to be seen. He ran in great big goofy strides through the rest of the water and fumbled to the shore, falling as he shone his light deep into the woods. Bobby and Brad had rifles. I'm not sure that made me feel safe, either as we all had been boozing up pretty heavily back at the fire, but it was all we had if the thing rushed us. We all ended up on the other shore, panting and shining our lights into the forest. I saw nothing. Not even a possum. 
Bobby was laughing and turning back to say something when it screamed again, lower and farther into the woods where the ground started its incline. Immediately, all lights fell on the spot where the noise came from. And again, there was nothing but four beams of light in a whole bunch of woods. Leading the pack, Bobby set out toward the incline with our lights sweeping the landscape in front of him. We reached the spot and stopped, searching even up in the trees and behind a set of huge boulders. Those were the only places anything of size could have possibly taken cover, yet there was nothing. The sound came again, this time from higher on the slope and sounding much lower in volume than before. Bobby took this to mean the thing was afraid and was running from us. Naturally, he gave chase and we followed. Shortly after that, Brad was telling stories his grandmother had told him years ago. Family legends, if you will. Now, I loved the old woman, but she could scare the color out of your hair with some of her stories. And I really wish Brad would shut up about it while we're chasing an unknown creature in the dark through a forest none of us were very familiar with. After a while of tracking the thing, Bobby started saying that someone was just messing with us and that we were doing nothing more than snipe hunting on a grander scale. It was probably the beer talking. Nevertheless, we continued to hunt for it and Brad kept on with his stories. The next time the scream came to us, it was more of a haunting, ethereal wail. If you can imagine the sound a woman would make if someone were cutting her fatally and slowly with a knife. The sound didn't die down quickly that time. It lingered and echoed, fading out as if the volume were being turned down. At least Brad shut up and Bobby stopped running headlong toward the noise. I tried to talk some sense into them, but it was no use. Instead of listening, they ran faster toward the sound. If it was a woman in trouble, they were not going to leave her to her fate. Me, on the other hand, I never believed it was a woman. It was some hybrid monster from Brad's horror stories. I was certain whatever it was, it was luring us into some sort of trap. We were too far from camp for me to turn back on my own, so I reluctantly followed them deeper into the woods. Old and new growth mingled together in a dense, nearly impassable thicket for a few hundred feet. The air had sprouted icy fingers and I was chilled to the bone. The air that had earlier been mostly still had gone restless. Walking about the woods, rattling leaves and rustling the debris on the forest floor. During that time, no one was talking, and it only made the absence of other sounds, normal sounds, stand out more in my perception. Our walking had slowed to a snail's pace as we made our way through the thicket. The wind died down, the icy fingers retracted, and the atmosphere became lighter. I could breathe easier. That didn't last long. The scream ripped through the night again and emanated from a dark outcropping of rocks 15 feet away. Bobby swung his light around. Three of the other lights immediately brightened the scene, and no one said a word. There were only rocks in front of us. Bobby stammered and, unable to get the words out, motioned for us to follow him as he circled the rocks. The screams had moved to the other side of the thicket, and Bobby ran toward it, yelling for whoever it was to stop. The rest of us were caught up in the moment and followed him without question. Whatever was screaming moved faster than we could swing our lights towards it, but it kept ahead far enough to keep us intrigued, and it kept us thinking that we were catching up to it. In my mind, at least, it became a possibility that we might catch it. We pursued it through the pitch dark of deep ravines where the smells of pines and rich black soil were overpowering. It led us on a winding course through the woods, and I don't think we even realized we were ascending. 
and I know for sure that none of us thought about getting lost. I certainly didn't. Getting lost was obviously the last thing on Bobby's mind too, as he broke into a run several times when the path allowed. The moon's cold light cast threads of silver through the hemlocks and glinted whitely off birch bark as we moved into a less dense part of the woods. The tree trunks were twisted and bent in odd, eerie angles and tumorous growths protruded from them, making it seem we had found the leprosy ward. The leaves at that height had already begun to dry, turn colors and fall to the ground. The air grew heavy. The wind moaned through the dry leaves, sounding like old bones rattling together. The scream faded to non-existent. A smell floated to us on that wind. It was something long dead, rotted away in a cold crypt and recently disinterred. Musty, dry, worm-eaten. Something that shouldn't be moving through the woods. We had unconsciously drawn together in a circle with our backs to each other as the scream sounded far off, as of leaking into our world from some other realm, descending into another shadowed ravine. We stood there on the cusp of sunrise with the sun coming up on my right and the moon still ruling on my left. We were like men waking from a twisted lucid dream. We never did see what was screaming that night. We had run for hours, all through the night without being aware of time passing, or of our direction. We came back into the full awareness near the top of a mountain, and we were completely lost. The journey down the mountain and back to our campsite took us until sunset that evening. The trek was long and arduous. No one in the group tried to make small talk. Hell, none of us even grumbled, though we were all exhausted and hungry. My friends still won't talk about the incident. Brad won't even conjecture about what the thing might have been. He just shakes his head and changes the subject entirely if I bring it up. And they called me the wimp, and razzed me so bad about not wanting to go after the thing. And it ends up that I'm the only one who wants to go back and find an answer. What did we chase all over that mountain? What could possibly distort time so badly that we spent hours up there getting more lost by the minute? And why would it bother? Just for the fun of it? Because it was bored? And how many others have disappeared deep in the woods because of something similar?